So the question this Sunday is printed here before us in this word bubble where Jesus says, does this offend you? Does this offend you? And then there's an open window next to it, open word bubble, for us to respond. Now the anthem that our choir just sang basically said that our answer will always be yes. Yes, Lord. Now what's the question? Well, what is the question? Jesus is talking and then he says, does this offend you? Sometimes, if we're honest, our first response is not, yes, Lord. Because for centuries, God has been speaking to different people, to all of us over time, and saying some pretty outrageous things. Way back when, God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, you're going to be the father of a great nation. And Abraham said, you know I am ancient. How can this possibly be? Are you crazy? And a while longer, God came to Mary and said, Mary, you're about to give birth to the Messiah for the world. And Mary said, how can this be? I'm not even married yet. So God's been saying outrageous things to people for ages and ages. Oftentimes, when we look closely, we see that these outrageous statements and the conversation that continued from them between God and these people led to a much deeper relationship between the people and God. So I'm hoping that we too can continue this pattern of daring to enter into conversations with Jesus and to answer honestly and hang in there and keep the conversation going until we get into a stronger relationship with our Lord. Well, in today's passage, Jesus has just multiplied five fish, no, five loaves of bread and two fish and fed a huge, huge crowd of people. We're told that it's the Passover season, the time when good religious people would gather together and remember and be grateful for the way that God led their people out of slavery and into the wilderness, through the wilderness, finally to the promised land how they would remember the difficulty of that journey and yet how God was with them every step of the way. And even when they got hungry, would send down manna from heaven, bread from the skies to feed them. This is what they're talking about this time of year after Jesus has just multiplied and fed so many people with so little food. Jesus does this and then he says something something pretty outrageous, maybe even offensive. He says to the people, you know, you're still hungry. You don't have everything you need. You need me, says Jesus. For I am the bread, he says, living bread who came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live and forever. The bread that I present to the world so that I can eat and live is myself, this flesh and blood self. Well, the people hear this and they say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Sometimes Jesus says things and we just struggle in response. It wasn't easy for people back then and it's not easy for us even today. You know, if Jesus had just stuck to serving that huge crowd from so little bread. If he could have fed those 5,000 and stopped with that, we could have called him the great bringer of the bread, and that would have been great. But instead, Jesus doesn't say that. He says, I am the bread, with some rather chilling implications. He said, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Well, I think it's no surprise that the early Christians were often accused of being cannibals. With language like this, what's with all this flesh and blood talk? Jesus keeps using that phrase over and over again four times in this passage. Eat my, eat my flesh and drink my blood. I think it's enough to turn any carnivore into a vegetarian. But if I think this is tough, 
Jesus' contemporaries had it even harder because their Jewish law forbid them to drink the blood of animals. Leviticus 17, 14 says, You shall not eat the blood of any creature, for the life of every creature is its blood. So, this is outrageous talk on Jesus' part. And even to us now, he says to us, You're dead. You have no life within you. You need my life. What, what does he mean that we need him to be alive? I mean, after all, we are strong, independent, self-sufficient Americans. We don't need anything, right? I don't know. Sometimes Jesus says some pretty outrageous, offensive things, and I'm always happy to hear when other people have the same reaction that I do, which is not always a positive response. I was delighted when I was reading Matthew Crosman's book to read this passage in it. He wrote, God has a habit of working in ways that I find annoying. Particularly upsetting to me was the time my small group leader, a woman whom I trust deeply, experienced a miraculous healing of cold sores after a televangelist encouraged her to place her hands on her television screen. Mere seconds after placing her hands on the screens, she was instantly and verifiably healed. Her husband, whom I also trust, confirms this story. This healing was facilitated by a televangelist with theology and politics that I found distasteful at best and dangerous at worst. God's total disregard for my cultural, political, and theological preferences is deeply troubling and profoundly offensive to my sense of how God and the world ought to work. That's what Matthew says, and I say, you said it, brother. Sometimes when Jesus says things and then asks us, does this offend you? I want to say, yes, it does. So, here's some good news. When we feel offended by something God has said, it's a sign that we may be approaching the heart of our spiritual struggle. We've come very close. And if we can hang in there with this conversation with our Lord long enough, we may come to have insight about the whole thing. We have to hang in there, trusting that we're not going to offend Jesus so much that he's going to leave. He's not going to leave. We've got to stay in there and keep the conversation going. So I've done some more reading, which maybe will help us through this rather difficult passage. Maybe part of our problem is that when we think about bread, we think of it as being kind of optional, not essential to our lives. We use forks and spoons and knives to move food from a plate to our mouths. And bread is often served at our meals, it's true, but it's often seen as a starter or as a side dish. Many of us who are watching our carb intake often choose to forego the bread completely. So when we hear about Jesus being the bread of life, it's easy to fall into thinking, oh, that's a metaphor that just means, you know, Jesus is a dinner roll, take it if you want it, but you don't have to, it's not central. However, in Jesus' day, it was radically different. They didn't use forks, knives, and spoons. They ate with their hands, and they often used bread to dip into the food and to braise it to their mouths. So while we tend to think of bread as an extra, for them it was critical. That was the only way. The bread was the only way they were going to eat this meal. So the main course that God sets before us for them could be accessed through Jesus as the bread of life. Not only that, the meals that you and I prepare or have prepared for us sustain us maybe for a few hours. But the supper, the bread that Jesus leads us to, lasts forever. It nourishes us, never ending. So we don't want to get too caught up 
to struggle with these things that Jesus says that sometimes strike our ears as offensive. Because if we take offense, if we get stuck there, or if we get stuck there because we refuse to believe that we really need Jesus that much, or, or if we start thinking, well, you know, he's like that dinner roll, he's optional, I don't really need it. I can have it if I want, but, you know, take it or leave it. If, if we do that, then it's, it's almost like some amazing chef has come to us and said, you look hungry. Look, I've prepared this beautiful feast for you, this huge banquet. Come and enjoy yourself. If someone like that, a chef said that to us, and we replied, why are you offering me all this food? How dare you call me hungry? I mean, that's just ridiculous. It really is. So when Jesus says to us, you're dead, you have no life within you, you need my life, if we take offense at that, we miss the opportunity to bring the wonderful banquet that God has prepared to us into our own lives. So I say, let us come to the table. Let us eat the banquet that Jesus has prepared for us. Let us keep the conversation going with Jesus, no matter what outrageous things we hear Jesus saying. Let's hang in there. Hang in there long enough that we may enjoy what God is providing for us, this life of abundance. Let's enjoy the feast. Amen.